All right, what is up everyone? My name is John Corey, LCDC3, student nurse as well. Um, go ahead and just thought I'd bring some content that I'm sharing with groups and individualized patients that we see here at Clinic 5 Recovery. Some of the latest stuff that we're taking a look at. So, start off here, you know, CARF and OMAS, highest accreditations that you can get as a recovery center. If you guys are interested in getting involved with our agency, please, we don't care in what way you get involved. We're just trying to find community partners and other people who are passionate about making a dent in the mental health field. So please reach out and get connected because we would love to get to know you. So starting off, we've got vaping. Um, you know, the incidences continue to rise where this fake vitamin E compound is being cut into vapes, primarily in the THC. So people will be selling it on street corners, at very low prices. They cut vitamin E in. Big problem that it's causing is all these teens are ending up in the emergency department. And what vitamin E does is it actually freezes those lung cells in place impairing that oxygen exchange. So O2 can't get in, CO2 can't get out, and it can be a life or death situation very quickly. There's been several cases where they're trying to do lung transplants for these young kids going to the hospital. As you can see, this young man right here, he's completely hooked up. They're trying to get him oxygen, but it's very, very difficult to do. So if you guys have children, you know, it's very important to know too, if you vape yourself, be very aware that this is a possibility. Do not ever buy anything from the the, the street corner, make sure it's a, a FDA approved product, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at, fentanyls have been a very big topic at our recovery center because fentanyl is the crisis of fentanyl, the amount that's being found, the amount that's showing up in all drugs, methamphetamine, marijuana, heroin, it's out of control, you guys, and the quality of this stuff, it's so potent at depressing the respiratory system, system that we cannot get ahead of it, okay? So this is one of the largest history, historical busts to date of fentanyl. As you can see, pretending that it was flour, smuggling it in with big burlap sacks and the fentanyl was actually enough to kill 8.5 billion people. That's 92% of the world population. That's a unbelievable statistic. One thing that I share in group is we have no way to destroy fentanyl. We can't burn it. We have no chemical that we can add to neutralize the compound because it's so resilient. So what we do right now is we're just building these underground warehouses where we store it. Now it's very, very dangerous and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on it because my biggest fear is if we ever go to war with another country, they won't target people, places. They'll actually look for these compounds and bomb those. What a better way to attack us than to release all that into the air. And this is a very big topic right now. It's up for a lot of controversy. So I'd love your guys' points on it. So moving right along, uh, this was a bus that happened in Ohio. And what they're finding is fentanyl and meth. And all these busts, police are always reporting that the amount of fentanyl being found with methamphetamine continues to go up. So I always ask, why is that? Why do you guys think? Personally, and what I've read through psychiatry uh, disciplines is how they cut methamphetamine into the fentanyl because fentanyl is so potent at causing death that methamphetamine will bump you up. So instead of causing death, you get that kind of synergistic effect of both of them acting together. Now it's very, very dangerous. Obviously the potential for addiction is multiplied because you've got two extremely powerful drugs acting on the brain, but extremely dangerous to the heart as well. So I would love your guys' thoughts as well on why are they doing this? Why are they cutting meth with fentanyl? It doesn't make sense, but when you think about it, it's kind of just to offset one another. But please let me know what you guys think. This is another case right now. This happened early February. What happened was this young man right here died in prison in North Dakota from withdrawal. What happened was he was vomiting to the point that he choked on his vomit and died. Security guards passed over him over and over and over again thinking, hey, he's just in withdrawal, he'll be fine. But as I dug deeper, I found this happens very, very frequently in prisons. People go in, whether it's from treatment, from the street, and they withdraw so bad that they end up dying. And if you can imagine, Choking on your on on your own vomit to death, it's a pretty violent death. And they're, they're seeing these cases continue to compound, continue to go up. And, you know, I think we can all agree that th this is wrong. This is definitely wrong. We've got a system that doesn't allow people who go into prison on withdrawal to get the help they need, the attention to this potentially life-ending 
situation. So me personally, I think that we should be collaborating with a medical care center that takes care of people who go into prison. Instead of having that person go into prison where drugs are usually plentiful, we have them go into a situation where they can get help, they can have a doctor, a nurse, assess and take care of them and make sure that their withdrawal does not progress to a life threatening situation. But once again, I would love your guys' thoughts on this. And if you guys have heard similar stories on this, I, I would greatly appreciate your, your insight on it. Moving along, this is one of the latest uh, Center for Disease and Control charts, courtesy of them for this chart. Very, very amazing to take a look. There was a very common theme that in 2018 and 2017, there was going to be a dip in the amount of overdose deaths. Now, what this chart demonstrates is overdose deaths reported for these opiates. Now, as you can see, heroin, prescription opiates, and you know all the other drugs, they're tapered off at right around 15,000 people per year. That's, that's quite a dividend to think that you know the problem's not slowing down, but it's just kind of continuing at 15,000. Now, if you take very close attention, this picture right here of fentanyl and synthetic opioids like carfentanyl are absolutely on the growth, you guys, killing on reported 30,000 people a year. This is out of control. It's absolutely amazing to think that the, the stigma around mental health, specifically medication-assisted treatment, has gotten so bad that we've allowed this problem to continue to grow and grow and grow. And as these cartels and makers of fentanyl continue to push it through our country, the problem gets worse and worse. As I've uh, shared with quite a few clients here, we no longer see heroin. It's very rare to see morphine come up in drug tests. We see a lot more fentanyl being present. And with that fentanyl comes all the problems of death, overdose, and the perpetuating cycle that allows this problem to go to the next level. So how are we gonna fix this? Now, as we take a look, Overdose deaths per 100,000 people, they do go state by state. If you're in the blue, you're seeing a decrease in overdose deaths. If you're going, if you're in the red, you're seeing an increase in overdose deaths. So it's very interesting to see that Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania are all seeing a decrease in overdose deaths. Now, I always ask clients, why do you guys think this is? And a big reason is we've pushed so much Narcan in all these states that we're actually seeing quite a bit of overdoses still but just fewer overdose deaths because you've got that safety net of Narcan. So is the problem really getting better? You guys, please let me know what you think. I personally do not think it's getting better. I think we've just got more safety nets that allow the problem to not cause death, but we're still getting these overdoses. So please, please, I'd love comments, concerns. This was uh, US News. They took a look at deaths per 100,000 population and they charted it through the years. As you can see, when fentanyl really took off 23, 2013 and 2014, we saw this unbelievable spike upward. This dotted line at the top says that, you know, that's an upper limit. They'd never expect any kind of problem to break that upper trend line. And as you can see in 2016, we broke that. So very, very, very important to that this gets as much attention as it can because this problem is out of control, you guys. And as we see in our recovery center, the fentanyl crisis will continue to go to the next level, even as we see crocodile pop up here and there. And lastly, you guys, I always end my group topic with a assertiveness or with a health topic. So this health topic this year is all around assertiveness training. You guys, there's a very fine line between aggressiveness and assertiveness. An assertive leader and an aggressive leader can both get the job done, but an aggressive leader comes in and they say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is your job. This is your job. Everybody shut up. Listen to me. An assertive leader comes in and they say, hey, what are the collective strengths around me? What are the things that I can utilize, put in the right place so that the whole company can go to the next level? And when you do that, you build rapport, you get support, it builds confidence, and it allows everybody to express their concerns, their ideas, and you get a better summation of everybody's goals in the company. So make sure that you're always trying to be an assertive and, and preaching that to, to your clients and in your program. And Jeff Bezos is a very big advocate of this. You know, Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world, he uses his left and right. So it's something that you personally can use. If you want to go to the next level in your career, make sure that you're asking ideas, asking concerns. There's a lot of studies that show a lot of people have concerns and ideas, but they don't voice them because they feel like the amount of attention that they'll be receiving is is not there. So make sure you voice those and receive them. The best way to do this is using the starting any comment out with I. So instead of saying is saying there is a problem here. Hey, we need to fix this. You start with I have a concern about I think that we should take a look at when you do that, it takes that defensive edge off and it adds to the topic that you're going to bring up in a non threatening way. So 
Guys, that is all I have for you. Um, really appreciate your time. If you guys have comments, ideas, please. I learn a lot from just getting feedback from not only clients, but viewers of videos. So let me know what you think. I would love to get questions and let me know. Till next time.